to worship this morning, uh, the third Sunday in Lent. Uh, this morning, we're going to be focusing primarily on the Gospel reading, uh, especially the latter portion of it. So as you'll, you'll notice as we go through the service, uh, a lot of the hymns will be geared towards the Trinity, uh, and that really does have something to do with the Gospel reading. So when uh, the reading comes up, I encourage you to keep your ears open for the Trinity, and if you don't hear it, which you might not, uh, I will be explaining this during the sermon. Yeah, I know, it's not working. So, uh, let us begin with our opening hymn, 506, Glory Be to God the Father. Father, I, the Lord, 
and ye shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massah and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together, Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us sing to the Lord. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at the Carabao, as on the day of the house of the wilderness. When your fathers put me to the test, and put no me to the proof, though they have seen my work. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Lord. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. For while we are still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that we we're still sinners. Christ died for us. This is the word of our Lord. And thanks be to God. I then invite you to rise and honor the words of our Lord. The Holy Gospel is according to St. John, the fourth chapter. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water 
will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty forever. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You're right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem. This is a place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to him, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. This is the Gospel of our Lord.
mercy, and peace be to you, in the name of God our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for meditation comes from John chapter 4. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and is now here, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. We worship who we know, but we might wish the one we worship, well, but he would make himself better known to us. Our Lord has definitely come to us in spirit and in truth, that we may come to know him through faith. But we desire him to be more uh, vocal than he typically is. The Lord absolutely communicates to us all the time, though. He comes to us in the sacraments that we might taste and see the Lord is good. And we hear him speak to us through the word of the scriptures. And we know Christ is present when we gather together in his name. Yet we wish to know our Lord more like the woman at the well came to know him. We wish to speak with our God about the exact issues in our lives and hear his specific response to what we said. This would definitely make times of uncertainty better, hearing his words address our exact situation of heartache. This we do not readily know, but the Lord is absolutely communicating to us through our lives that we worship Him. Many things regarding our Lord are not obvious. What is readily noble, uh, noble to us, though, lies within the love our Lord has for us. It is this love of God the Father which sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world that, we, that he might suffer and die for the forgiveness of our sins. And it's also obvious that Christ loved us by upholding his promise of giving the Holy Spirit to all believers. Through the Spirit given by Christ, we receive the love of Christ when the Spirit unites us to him in baptism. It's also most obvious to us that our response to God's love is to serve him in love serving and obeying our Lord in faith by helping others. Trust him in his mercy when we fail to do this as well. So in other words, the law and the gospel are the obvious parts of our faith. The more difficult things to understand would be, well, perhaps the nature of the Trinity, having one God in three persons. Yet this is the truth. It is even in our text for meditation, although it is not terribly obvious to see. Jesus tells us, and the woman at the well, true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. What is truth? Now, the concept of truth is kind of elaborate in the Gospel of John, but truth is talked about again and again as the revelation Christ gives to us, that he must suffer, die, and rise again for our salvation. Or put another way, Jesus tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. What Jesus means is that it is only through his actions, his salvation, that we are reconciled back to the Father. Were we left as sinners, the Lord would judge us according to our sins. Thus, Jesus accomplished the forgiveness of all sins at the cross. We who live in the way of faith live in Christ's own life, a life which defied death and rose from the grave. True worshipers must worship God the Father in the truth of Christ because it is only through the truth of Christ's destruction of our sins and the truth of his, his raising us to new life, that we may dwell with our Heavenly Father forever. So, 
If we worship the Father, then we worship the Father in spirit and in the truth of Jesus. So what does that make the Spirit here? Well, of course, the Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Jesus is not telling us that we must remove ourselves entirely from physical objects in worship, that we are to worship only spiritually, not physically. Because if he didn't mean that, then there would be no way he would actually encourage us who gather together regularly in the flesh to worship God as one body of Christ. And there would also be no way that Jesus would actually institute the Lord's Supper, where we eat and drink bread and wine for the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, because that is a physical substance using physical processes to give us salvation or forgiveness of sin. So, when Jesus says we are to worship the Father in spirit, what he's actually doing is he's pointing us to all the actions of the Holy Spirit in worship. The Spirit has baptized us through water that we may gather together as God's own children. The Spirit unites us as the body of Christ, despite us being many in number. The Spirit called, causes us to call on the name of the Lord for our salvation, and of course, the Holy Spirit gives to us the forgiveness of sins pronounced by the pastor following our confession. Every action of worship is done in unison with the Spirit who is here with us. So when Jesus tells us to worship the Father in spirit and in truth, he is saying that we are to worship the triune God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The only way we can worship the Father is through the working of forgiveness of Jesus Christ on the cross and the working of holiness by the Holy Spirit who dwells within every believer. It might not have been obvious to you from what you heard in the Gospel reading, but it is nonetheless there. The Lord is with us in mysterious ways. God is always at work among us in our worship. Worship cannot be worship without God here among us. Whenever you gather here in the divine service, or whenever you pray, whenever you serve your neighbor in Christ's name, there your God is present with you and providing you with his grace. Without his love and support, you cannot offer up hymns of praise for things here. Without his promise of life, your plea for forgiveness and repentance would fall on deaf ears. Living in God through faith means living in the grace of God which establishes you in the life of Christ. But what about the times when this is not so obvious? What about the times when hmm, we feel like we don't know God as well as we would like to know Him? Most of us go about day by day without constant prayer. Many people find it difficult to regularly do devotions. We're God right in front of your face. Not just in the spirit, but in the body of Jesus Christ, for example. Standing right there in front of you. Where you see him. You might be more conscientious about the grace you have received. But the difficulty arises because we want God to be no more intimately than simple belief. We want a God who is always coming to us and providing his warmth and presence. And even though we might be trying to find that in oof, a little more substantial way, we nonetheless have this already. We don't just have a faith which is a simple statement of fact. Our faith is far more than this. Our faith is what brings us into the life of Christ. It is a direct participation in our Lord, or if you will, our relationship. So we do actually have more than statements of facts professing our beliefs. We have the way, the truth, and the life. It is this truth of Christ which comes to us through faith that we possess eternal life. Through faith we are constantly being supplied with the forgiveness which surpasses all understanding that lifts us out of the deadness of our sins and into the new life of Christ. 
So our salvation is not just left to when we are consciously acknowledging it, when we're actively engaged in devotions, because if it were, we would all be lost to sin as soon as we went to sleep at night. Not conscious, but unconscious to what God does for us. No, our salvation is actually a constant working of the Holy Spirit who dwells within all believers. The Holy Spirit is always bringing us to Christ because that is His work. In our periods of neglect of God's work, and all of us do go through these periods, it is the Holy Spirit who is looking after us and urging us to return unto our Lord. The Spirit does not wish for us to spend our lives in unbelief, but to repent of our sins, be cleansed by the blood of Christ, and be established once again in constant worship. This is because the Holy Spirit has baptized us into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We are not only in the name of the Lord, we are in the Lord. We are one with the Lord because the Lord unites us with Him through baptism, in the name of the Trinity, and act of worship. If you are faithful, the word the Lord is still faithful to you, for he cannot deny himself. Even if you neglect him, he still knows you and comes to you that you may rest in him. It is and has always been more about our God's knowing you than you knowing him. He came to you in the word of the gospel before you ever knew him. He drew you up out of sin long before you knew what you should be doing in life. Or as our reading from Romans today said, while we were still sinners, while we were still godless, Christ came, came to the ungodly. Christ came for us, he died for us, that even though we were apart from him, even though we were not following in him, even though we were not worshiping him, he might come to us so that we might be joined to him and praise him for the love which he shows to us forever. So even in the times we look, he comes to us. Even when we neglect him in times of storm and stress. Because the times of storm and stress tend to be when we are neglectful of proper worship. And you might ask how this can be, since most likely in these times of hardship, you'll be on your knees praying in tears. And God certainly wants you to pray to Him with tears and hardship and with laughter and times of joy. Because He welcomes all of your words. But during times of hardship, when we find it hard to focus, as it were, we sometimes neglect in our sorrowful prayers a trust in the Lord's promises. Sometimes we move our eyes off of what God has done and is doing and only focus on the issue at hand. Sometimes we forget that the Lord promises that he works all things to the good of those who trust in him. Our hearts can be distracted away from trust to be focused on pain and death, because that tends to be what we, and all of what we see at those times. That the Lord can work pain and sickness and even death itself to his good purposes. He promises this, and he will do it. So then, when you find yourself surrounded by the pain and sickness and death, what should you be doing at the worst of times? In effect, nothing. Let the Lord work according to his love for you, and according 
according to his love for those who care about him. In the times of storm and stress, trust that he will take care of you. He always has and he always will. And that will never change, even though it might not be obvious at those times. Many things concerning our Lord are not obvious. They're hard to see. They're hard to understand. However, we still know our Lord. We know Him well enough through the promises of the Gospel that He will take care of us always, in times of plenty and in times of need. He will continue to bless us through worship, through prayer, and through the promises of baptism. So let us worship Him in spirit and truth. Let us worship knowing the Holy Spirit will continuously draw from the well of God's saving grace for our eternal life. And let us worship knowing that Jesus went to the cross for our forgiveness and will raise us from death. These things the Lord has done that we might know him eternally, and these things we know intimately as God gives us these things. The promise of salvation, the promise of holiness, the promise of life everlasting. He promises these things that we know through him. Amen. May the peace which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds in the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to rise with me. Let us begin with the singing of the offer. Serve our nation and 
justice and truth, then we may lead a peaceful life of integrity. Grant health and favor to all who bear office in our land, especially His Majesty the King, the Governor General, the Prime Minister of the Parliament, the Government of this province, the province, and all who have authority over us. Help them to serve this people according to your holy will. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Take from us all hatred and prejudice. Give us the spirit of love and order our days and your peace. Prosper the labor of those who work to bring peace and justice to the nations of the world and mutual understanding and common endeavor may be increased among all peoples. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Let your blessing remain upon the sea time and harvest, the commerce and industry, the leisure and rest, the arts and culture of our people. Take under your special protection those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and who have always put their hands to any useful task. Give them the just rewards for their labor and the knowledge that their work is a blessing in themselves. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. By your word and Holy Spirit, comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity, especially, O oh Lord, we put before you Margaret, Hildegard, Gail, Jean. Bruce, Wilfred, Ruth, William, Kent, Rob, Judith, Lynn, Paul, Queen, Eve, Noah, and Titus, and all those we name in our hearts now. Be with those who suffer persecution for the faith, have mercy on those to whom death draws near. Bring consolation to those in sorrow, and grant to all a measure of your love, taking them into your tender care. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. All of these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
nights, on the night when he was betrayed to bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup's the new testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
song to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you. 